Hope Chapel. Come on, let's stand up on our feet this morning. Let's enter his house with praise and thanksgiving. He is good. It's who he is. So come on, let's worship him. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. Hey, I know that you are always up to something good.
an eternal promise that we have. Those of us who are a part, all of us who get to take part in the kingdom of God, we will be singing this song forever and ever to join with all of heaven in singing our highest praise. That's what I love about the kingdom of God is that it is an inclusive kingdom. There's no exclusivity about it, that all are welcome to the kingdom of God. I'm reminded this morning in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, it says, you will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door, no more barriers between heaven and earth or earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven and a no on earth is no in heaven. I know that today we are maybe celebrating a different kingdom. I'm even wearing it across my shirt. But there is something about the kingdom of God that welcomes us all in. And as great as the other kingdom is, the kingdom of God this morning is is accessible to you. And it is not a, a, a spectatorship. All who come can participate. And so whatever you come into this place with, whether it be a request, a need, a desire, he hears it and he sees it because there's a place for you here. And I just want this morning, not from my words, but from the word of God to dispel the lie that you have no place in the kingdom of God, that you have no seat, that your name is not written down at the table, but in fact, actually it is. We are all welcome, those of us who wear the name of Jesus on our hearts. And because of that, there's another promise given to us in Matthew chapter seven, and it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. See, whatever you're going through this morning, he's available to you. If you are in a passionate pursuit, trying to to find him and you are seeking him with all of your heart, you will find him. If you have a burden and and a need and a desire and request that's burning in your soul, you can ask him. He hears And those of us might be in the room this morning, we feel like we are pounding at the door. Please, someone let me in, please. I'm just trying to get to the king. That door is open for you this morning. And so as we continue to worship, I want you to know your place this morning. And that is you have been bought with the price and you have been redeemed to be called a a child, a son and daughter of the king. There's a co-heirship that we get to partake in this morning. And so don't let one for one second, a lie of the enemy keep you from pressing in and asking, seeking his presence, knocking at that door because you've been given a promise that he's there on the other side of that. So Lord, as we continue in this time and we actively pursue your presence and we sing these words as really a prayer of surrender. God, I pray that those of us in this room who are desperate for answers, who are desperate for your presence, who are desperate for that door to be opened would would find that promise to be fulfilled this morning as we know that you keep all of your promises that when we ask you will answer. When we seek, we will find. And when we knock, the door will be opened. We worship you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
a miracle starts Beyond what I want, beyond what I see The change for my world beginning in me I'm wholly surrendered, Lord, do what you Just make me a vessel, this life has an offering. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. Come and sing.
have it all. Let's sing. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. You can have it all. You can have it all, God. You can have it all. You can have it all. So pour out your spirit on our praise. Come let revival. Come on, lift your voice. Stir up our faith for greater things. Lord, we ask, we seek, we pray. All this to lift up and proclaim. Jesus Christ, the highest name. Send us your power, light the flame. Lord, we ask, we seek, we pray. your children come before you this morning and we are fervently asking seeking you and praying for things so many things scattered around the room you know what they are God and you hear every single one of them God but we know there's one thing for certain that we are all collectively seeking you for and it's that your kingdom be made here on earth on earth as in heaven God, that we, the words that we're singing, they're not just in vain, God, we mean it. Come let revival fill this place and you'd stir up our faith for something greater. So God, we thank you for this time that we get to spend with you in your presence. Never let us be quick to, to move on from what you're doing in this space. God, would you help keep our heart postured here? Help keep our mind and our eyes fixed on kingdom things. God, and always remember who you've called us to be, which is son and daughter of the Most High, who you have a seat at the table to feast with you, to build your kingdom with. Lord, we thank you. We love you. This is all for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. It is a fun time to be living in Kansas City, isn't it? It's a fun time. Even better day to be in church. I have to say, you guys look good in red. You look really good in red. I'm glad that you're here today on an incredible Sunday morning as we wrap up our Love and Marriage series. Maybe this is your first time or your first time in a long time with us. And if that's the case, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We'd love to get to know you, and you can help us do that by maybe sticking around after service and heading to the Blue Connect banner. But as well, you can reach in the seat back pocket in front of you, grab this card that says, hello, friend. Take a moment to fill it out. In a few moments, some buckets will pass by, and you can drop that card right in. Or if digital is more your speed or you're watching online, you can pull out your phone and just text the words, Hope Chapel, all one word, all lowercase to 94000. That will allow us to let, uh, that will let us know that you're here and we can reach out and say thanks for coming and answer any questions you have. Again, stop by that booth because we have a gift that we want to give you to say thank you for being here. And that card is also for all of us in the room today because it's a way how you can let us know how we can be praying for you. We love praying for you and standing with you and the things that you're facing in life, highs and lows. And so let us know how we can do that more effectively. This past Wednesday, we gathered for Seek First Wednesday. We're in the North Auditorium. We gathered for a night of prayer and worship. And that takes place, our prayer meetings, every single Wednesday night. So make sure you fill that in and let us know how we can be praying for you. Well, this coming Wednesday is a big Wednesday because it is Ash Wednesday, which is the start of the season that we call Lent. If you're unfamiliar with Lent, it is the 40 days that's leading up to Easter. It's a time in the church calendar where we pause. It's marked by repentance, a time marked by surrender. And Ash Wednesday kicks it all off. Even when you open up the pages of scripture, you see ashes symbolize grief. You see ashes symbolize repentance. And on Ash Wednesday, we take the palms that we lay down on Palm Sunday in the former year, and they, we turn them into ash and wear them in the sign of the cross on our head, not on a tradition, not on a rule following, but as a sign that we want to bear the mark of Christ, the mark of the cross. 
And those ashes that we put it on our body with symbolize our mortality, symbolize our desire for repentance, our need for full submission. And so we want to invite you into a special Ash Wednesday gatherings this coming Wednesday. And you have two options. You can do one or either or both. Wednesday morning from 7 a.m. till 9 a.m. in our prayer room, there will be Ash Wednesday prayer. The prayer room will be open for two hours and you can come for 15 minutes on your way to work. You can come and stay the whole two hours. It's just a time of self-guided prayer. We'll have live worship music. We'll have um, a sheet that will help you walk through a, a moment of prayer between you and Jesus. We'll have some pastors in the room if you would like to receive the imposition of ashes. And then that evening, we will have our Ash Wednesday service, 6.30 p.m. in the North Auditorium. And so we, we pray that you'll be able to join us for one or both gatherings as we start this Lent season together. And we have given you a Source called Canyons. This will be our Lent series where we're walking expositionally verse by verse through Psalm 23. And so this is a devotional that we're going to put in your hands today. You can grab one on your way out that will start this coming Wednesday. So make sure you grab one today. The devotional starts Wednesday and we'll walk you day by day and just just help you walk through this 40-day Lenten season, giving you scriptures to read each day, meditations and prayers. And so make sure you get your devotional that will walk us through our brand new series that starts on Sunday called Canyons. Well, we're gonna take a moment in this moment to continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And the Bible says that we are to be renewed and transformed by the renewing of our minds. The truth is in our life, we have already been formed. Our hearts have been formed. And so what we are in need of is transformation. And that happens as our minds are changed to have the mind of Christ, to think like him. And I think maybe there's no more true area where we need this transformation than in our ability to be generous with what God has given us. You see, we have already been formed. We've been formed to think that we don't have enough and we have to be transformed to remember that God will provide us with all that we need. We have been formed to think that we are our own providers and we have to have our minds transformed to remember that God is our provider. We have been formed to think that we don't want to give because we want to keep for ourselves, but our minds have to be transformed to remember that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so I just wanna take a moment to ask us in this area of our money, it's a part of our discipleship. You have been formed. How do you need to be transformed? Because often it's this one area of our life where we say, God, you can have it all except in my money, that's mine. And I tell you what, when we step into full surrender, full surrender of our hearts and everything we have, everything we think, everything we are, I tell you what, God can do powerful things in our life. And maybe this is the one step where you just say, I, I gotta take a step forward of obedience and it's scary and it's hard and I don't want to, but I have faith that God will meet me there when I give him my whole self. And so we're going to take a moment to give. And as we give this morning, some of you give midweek online, that's great. But if you want to give in this moment, we pass buckets down the aisle where you can make that a part of your worship. If you're newer around here, maybe you just want to drop this card in the bucket as it passes. And if you want to give a different way, you can see the directions on the screen behind me. But as we take a moment to give this morning of our tithes and offerings, I want to pray for us as we give, but I also wanna pray for us as we open our, up our hearts to receive from God's word this morning. So will you pray with me? Father, what an honor it is to gather together this morning. Lord, we turn our hearts, our minds, our attentions to you in prayer this morning, knowing that you hear us when we pray. Would you reveal to us the parts of our hearts that have already been formed in the way of the world and need to be transformed into your likeness? And would you give us the courage, the boldness, the obedience to take bold steps forward in that direction? Lord, may we recognize that everything we have is a good gift from you. And so we give in this time as cheerful givers, recognizing that you are the God who provides everything we need anyways. And we trust you. And Lord, as we open up our hearts to receive, Lord, we thank you. It says that your word does not return void. That when we read scripture and we hear it, we believe it, we obey it, God, it, it changes us. It's fruitful in our lives. And so we thank you for that. So may we hear clearly from you and receive all that you have for us today. We lay all other distractions aside and we lean in in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Whatever season you find yourself in, God has much to say in the Bible about how to find hope in Him and bring hope to others. How do we live purposefully in each of these seasons? How do we seek holiness in relationships? How do we apply the words of Scripture to the nuance of our circumstances? What does God have to say? Well, I hope you've enjoyed on the way in the the lobby and the festivities, and I can see that so many of you are in red, a little bit of yellow, but primarily red and white, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Today is Super Bowl Sunday, and the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl once again. Now, I, I, I got to be honest with you, though. Uh, this week, I, I was in a few different airports on a trip with layovers and all of that, and I was wearing Chiefs gear. And back in 2019, it was a very different experience than it is now. I don't know if you've been out and traveled in Chiefs gear. But uh, in 2019, we were playing the same team, and people are high-fiving me. It's your time. Go get it. This time, people are, like, booing me, actively booing me. Uh, I've got people going, not you again. The TSA lady, I think it was convinced I needed to be patted down because I was in Chiefs gear. It was, it was a very different experience, which just tells you we've been in the Super Bowl probably too much, but I frankly don't care. I think this is awesome. So it's, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, it's good. Uh, we're going to have some celebration. There, there's a lot going on. Uh, I'll tell you, back to 2019, in fact, uh, my daughter was in first grade. I think she was in first grade. And the the teacher at that time for the first Chiefs Super Bowl did this little Patrick Mahomes style cutout, and then it said, if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, I will dot, dot, dot. And then they, they had all these different things to list. And little did those teachers know, this would become like part of their annual curriculum to just have like a Patrick Mahomes cutout for Super Bowl Sunday. And, and so my wife was walking down the hallways of the school and snapped a few photos just sort of as, you know, sort of this memory of what our daughter went through. And these are some of this year's. It says, if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, I will scream so loud, the whole house will hear me. It's a very different hole in the house. Um, I will play football for the rest of my life, right? Somebody else said, scream and jump up and down on the couch, even though it's dangerous. Uh, Someone else said, I will cry with happiness. Uh, Somebody else said, I will hug my Chiefs bear very, very tight. And somebody else said, I will do a cartwheel, which is what I will not try tonight. Uh, I will go cuckoo crazy. Uh, And then somebody else said, um, I will run and jump in my bed in sadness. (laughs) There's always a kid that's not a Chiefs fan in every class. You know what I'm saying? Now, the bottom line is that a lot of what's being talked about for this Super Bowl is legacy. Like, what will be Mahomes' legacy? Will he be the greatest of all time? What will be Andy Reid's legacy? Is this now called a dynasty with three Super Bowls in four years? All of that is being discussed. And they're not the only ones talking about legacy. We're going to talk about legacy this morning here at church. And it, it lined up. I mean, we, we were planning to talk about this. You know, we're in this love and marriage series, and we started out in week one talking about singleness. Then we talked about dating. Then we talked about marriage. We've gone through most of the relationship statuses you put on social media. And, and we know that a lot of marriages produce children. And when you have children, it makes you start thinking about legacy. It starts making you think about multi-generational thinking. And it's good for you to think about multi-generational thinking. Like, like, what will the legacy of my life be? What will people remember me for? Will I make a significant uh, input to this society? I mean, what will come of all of that? Those are good questions, and they're good questions because the Bible talks a lot about it. I remember when I was in first grade, it was in the early 80s, and we, uh, we made something called a time capsule. Did anybody else make a time capsule? We got this like uh, shoe box out as a class, and we put some nickels and some books from our classroom. And, uh, in the early 80s, like Nintendo wasn't out yet, and so one of my friends had an Atari game, and he put the Atari game in there, and we, we boxed it all up, and we dug a hole, and we put it in the back of the, the grade school uh, so that it could be opened 30 years later in the futuristic Jetsons year of 2015. And uh, 
And, and I'll tell you, like, my, my grade school got tore down. I don't know what happened. Maybe the construction guy uh, bulldozed it and found it and was like, oh, this is really interesting. But, but we, we did it because we wanted to try and capture one moment in history that could be enjoyed by another generation of history. Like we wanted to somehow seize it as an important part of our lives that we wanted to have passed down to somebody else. And I think that's at the heart of everybody desiring to leave a legacy, isn't it? Like we want to be able to capture something and be able to pass down that somebody else may do better than we did. And I think that's a very human part of what it means to exist in this world. But the Bible talks about it in a more dynamic way. When you open up the scriptures, you see in, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that God talks a lot about generations. He talks a lot about framing our perspective on what matters and what doesn't matter. He, he, he walks us through a lot of what it means to walk in relationship with him. In fact, so much so that we're not just talking about covenants and we're not just talking about uh, how God relates to us, but we're talking about his very identity. I don't know if you realize this, but, but God is described with a number of names. A, a number of names are used to, to picture uh, who God is and what he's all about. Uh, he's referred to as a provider. He's referred to as strength. He's referred to as the Alpha and Omega. He's referred to as the I Am. And he's also referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the multi-generational God, not just the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, but the multi-generational God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's set with this whole framework that we see through scripture. Psalm 79, 13 says, then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture will praise you forever from generation to generation. We will proclaim your praise. Psalm 145, 4, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts over and over, whether it be the name of God or whether it be the scriptures of God, there's this idea that we're thinking about legacy. There's another piece to the scriptures that I think is there as well. And it's this idea of the genealogies. Like genealogies are all throughout the scripture. And when I was first reading my Bible, I used to kind of skip over them because I didn't know all the names and they're really hard to pronounce. And I didn't really see the value or the meaning behind it. But over and over through scripture are these genealogies that take up a big part of the Bible. Like if you go to Genesis chapter five, you see the genealogy of Cain and Abel. If you go to Genesis chapter 10, you see the, the legacy of, of Noah's sons and their genealogy. And then you go to the first eight chapters of First Chronicles. And all of that is the genealogy of the nation of Israel. And then you go to Matthew chapter 1, the first 17 verses. You got the genealogy of Jesus. And then Luke chapter 3 is also the genealogy of Jesus. And, and I started to wonder, why do these genealogies exist? And there's a number of different reasons. One, for instance, we know that it gives us a, a historical picture of mankind. It reminds us that we're reading a historical book. It kind of puts things into perspective as well on when things happen to kind of give us a lay of the land so that we can better understand things like prophecies and blessings and curses. But then there were also really practical reasons for this as well. Michael Wilkins, who is a professor emeritus at Biola University, he said it this way. He said, God's people kept extensive genealogies, which served as a record of a family's descendants, but were also used for practical and legal purposes to establish a person's heritage, inheritance, legitimacy, and rights. Knowledge of one's descendants was especially necessary if a dispute occurred to ensure that property went to the right person. And we often forget that we're talking about the ancient world. There is no county deeds office to tell you who owns what land. And most of a person's wealth was wrapped up in their inheritance from one generation to the next. And so to settle land disputes over whose land and whose livestock it was, we often go back to genealogies. Well, that's my dad, and that was my grandfather, and that was his grandfather, and so on and so forth, to, to make sure that wealth was preserved amongst a clan or amongst a family. 
But beyond that, it's not just for practical reasons. Genealogies also had a specific spiritual significance. Like we understand that there are blessings and curses all through the Bible. The blessing that was given to Moses or a blessing that was given to Abraham and how those blessings were passed on from generation to generation. And sometimes when you're reading your Bible, it gets really problematic because you read passages that kind of bother you through your 21st century Western ears. Maybe the best example of this is found in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 gives us the Ten Commandments, and it starts in verse 5 by saying, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. I'll stop right there and say that is problematic to Western ears. Because if you're like me, you read that the first time, and you went, someone's paying for the sin of their parents and of your grandparents, I don't want that. In fact, that doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like a loving God would expect the children and the grandchildren to pay the price for parents and grandparents. Now, I'm just going to, as a side, say how hypocritical this is because we never do this when it comes to blessing. When it comes to blessing, we're always like, oh, the blessings of the grandparents and of the parents should be passed down to the kids and the grandkids. But we always do it with curses. That said, that said, if you're still bothered by this, I want you to know the Old Testament gives us another side to the coin. And and it's not just one or two verses, but over and over. I'll give you a couple of examples. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children children put to death for their parents, each will die for their own sin. It's the idea of individual responsibility. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 also says, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. Okay, makes me feel a little bit better. But then when I go back to Exodus 20 verse 5, I got to ask the question, why is it there? Why is it there? And I think what's really important to remember is that when we see this laid out, it isn't just the sins of the grandparents and the parents being passed down, but he goes on to say, of those who hate me, and then finishes by saying, and those who love me, I will go on to bless for a thousand generations. Those who hate me is the key. And here's the whole point of why I've taken you for the last few minutes on this journey of the biblical narrative when it comes to generations. Because something always gets passed down. Something always gets passed down. The grandparents and the parents clearly pass down a thinking, uh, actions, a worldview, a mindset to their parent or to their children that would cause them to also hate God. Something got passed down from a grandparent or a parent to the kids because something always gets passed down. If you want to think about legacy, the first thing you got to think about is that you are always passing something down to the next generation, whether you're thinking about it or not. And this is crucial as a baseline understanding to then understand how God works, because it's not just like you're passing down mannerisms or you're passing down language, but you're also passing things down spiritually as well. This is where we get this idea of of looking at generational blessing and generational cursing. Now, maybe you've been in somebody's house and you've seen on the wall in their foyer something that's called a family tree. And it's kind of got like uh, great grandparents and parents and all of that. You can go on to Ancestry.com or do a little 23andMe situation. Go down to the library, research and get your your ancestry and figure out your bloodline. And that's kind of fun to do. I, I did that myself. One Christmas, I got really bored, did that, went all the way back. It was awesome. And and that's great. And you can look at the family tree and that will tell you one thing and give you one lens. However, when we start talking about the spiritual implications, we might look at that same family tree. And some of you, when you see your family tree, you don't see the bloodline. You don't see how Scottish you are or how uh, much of the Islander is in you, but you see a very different family tree and it's a very different lens. You see generational poverty you see generational anxiety. You see generational addiction. 
You see generational broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship. You see patterns and behaviors. You know, in the, the mental health space, we refer this as a genogram. It's like doing the same exercise, but through a different lens. Not through the biological lens, but through the spiritual and mental health lens. You begin to see patterns and behaviors that begin on the inside to make you feel like, will this pattern ever be broken? Now, whether you've ever verbalized it or not, I know for me, I've thought things like that. And I've got great parents, great grandparents. I've got uh, great people in my family line. And yet there are still things within that family line, like every family line, where you just go, am I going to be defined by that? And we think these things as lids. And some of us, we rise up because we got that fight or flight. We're the fighter. And we just go, I will not be defined by that. And I will do something different with my life. And we have. And others of us who go, I will be buried under this for the rest of my life. History is bound to repeat itself in me. Now, this idea of a blessing and a curse is real in Scripture. And there are certain uh, groups within Christianity that talk a lot about blessings and curses and generational blessings and curses and breaking those things down. And that's because it's absolutely biblical, not just in the Old Testament, but as we'll see into the New Testament as well. But the idea of how you go about breaking those things down is exactly the same. How do you break a curse over your family? The scriptures tell us you break a curse over your family through repentance, meaning you turn and you start going in a new direction. Deliverance always begins with repentance, a willingness to turn and go in a new direction, to say, this will not be. But you got to break it down, and it's not always so easy. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean it's automatically just going to crumble. I love what Pete Scazzaro says about the genogram. He says, Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa is in your bones. And I think a lot of us relate to that. You could be a Christian and still have things in your life, still be anxiety ridden, still be broke down and beat down in the area of your finances, still have broken relationships. There's a different level of breaking that needs to take place and a different level of repentance that needs to take place. Now, to give you an idea of how repentance works, let's let's start with the curse that we all experience in this life. It's the idea that all of us have fallen short of fulfilling the law and having a right relationship with God on our own. Every one of us, every one of us is flawed. We're not perfect. And so Jesus comes in and takes this curse on himself and breaks the curse over us and offers us new life and relationship in him. That's what we call the gospel or the good news. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 describes it this way. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. He breaks the curse and offers us the blessing of relationship with God. He breaks the curse and offers us a blessing of favor, breaks the curse and offers us a new identity, a new birth order, a new birth line, a new family to be a part of. 1 Peter 2 goes on to say, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You've been healed. You've been restored because of what Christ has done. And for those Christians who have received this with good news, we no longer live under a curse, but a blessing because we have come to a point of surrender. We have repented. We've moved in a new direction and we've experienced deliverance in our heart in this area. But why is it then that you can, you can surrender your life and still live with anxiety? Why is it that you can surrender your life and still live with addiction? Why is it that you can surrender this area? Because we're in the process of discipleship, which means we're becoming like Christ, which means surrender happens on multiple layers and multiple levels in your life as you become like Christ. It means every day I wake up and I surrender my life to Christ and I surrender my anxiety. 
It means I surrender my life to Christ, and in surrendering my life to Christ, I surrender my addictions. In surrendering my life to Christ, I also surrender my anger. I surrender my brokenness. I surrender all that I am that I might experience the fullness of blessing that Christ offers me. I've still got to walk through the door even though it's on display and offered to me. This is the big difference that people don't always understand. That deliverance and freedom always begins with repentance, a willingness to turn and move in direction. This is the principle. We're always passing something down. What are we passing down? I, I, looked at, um, I looked at my wife, as I often do, just the other day, and I was like, honey, I say this to her often. I go, honey, we are definitely messing our kids up. And she looked at me, she goes, yeah. And I go, yeah. And I said, and I have no idea how we're doing it. And I said, but in about 20 years, we're going to find out how. And I'm, I, I, why? Because everybody's messing their kids up. I just should start like a, a therapy fund now is how it feels, right? And it's because something is always being passed down. Something is always being passed down. If you don't remember anything else I say this morning, I want you to remember this. Like, like, okay, first, Christ has called you. It's okay that you're passing something down. Let's, let's just be okay with it. Because Christ has called you to pass something down. The, the Great Commission is Matthew 28, 19. And what does it say? Go and make disciples of all nations. What does disciples of all nations mean? Going and passing something down. Go and lead people to live like Jesus. Pass it on. Pass on what you've received. Don't just receive it, but pass it on. Pass it on. And so if this is true, that we are called to go and make disciples, then may you never forget, and this is the thing I want you to remember more than anything else I say, that every decision is discipleship. Every decision you make with your life is discipleship. Every one of us experiences discipleship in different ways, but Every decision you make with your life is discipling somebody into something. You may not think about it. It may have never crossed your mind before, but you are discipling people around you. Like, it, we, we disciple people all the time, right? Not just with mannerisms, but uh, and, and, and the, here's what happens, right? We disciple people over time, and then families start adopting that. Like You're going to disciple people based on did you, did you go to church today? You're, you're discipling people based on where did you go to lunch? And then families will say things like, that's the place my family always goes to lunch. And then we say things like, well, that's the place that my family likes to vacation whenever we vacation, if we get to vacation. That, that's, the, that's the car. Like my family, we always drive Fords or we always drive Toyotas. My family, we, we always buy these kitchen appliances. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're always discipling somebody into something. I, I'm looking out at a sea of red today. Somebody discipled you into something. <laughs> I, I love this last night, or sorry, last Sunday night, Pastor Jamie was talking to our leaders and our partners, and he stood up, he was talking about discipleship, and Lord help him, he's a Dolphins fan. He moved here a few months ago. Um, I, I hope you'll join me in interceding for our brother uh, as he walks his journey. And uh, he, he was up on stage. He goes, you know what? He goes, he goes, almost every day somebody invites me to be a Chiefs fan. He goes, he goes, the culture of Chiefs discipleship is strong in this city. He said, people go, well, how long is that going to last? And he just goes, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not planning to change. And they go, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Look, friends, discipleship is everywhere. And so, and I'm not trying to beat you down, especially if you're a parent in the room. But look, if, if a culture of prayer is not in your home, don't expect it to be there in the next generation. If a culture of being a part of a faith community is not there with consistency, don't expect it to be there in the next generation. Every decision is discipleship. 
And when you tease that out, it's both exciting and terrifying. It has everything to do with the legacy that you're going to leave in this life. You are a disciple maker, whether you're a disciple maker of Jesus or not, is up to you. But you are a disciple maker into something, into something. Now, this conversation kind of leads us down this road of thinking about it through the lens of what I might call investing. It's the idea of making an investment. And if you're not investing, then you're probably a consumer. And there's a big difference between being an investor and being a consumer. Consumers are all about what they can get out of something for themselves. And investors are all about what they can deposit into somebody else. Like, I'm going to make an investment into you. Whether it's a corporation and you're buying stock, or whether it's a coffee that you're going to have with somebody to, to share some insights, wh whatever it is, you're investing or you're consuming. And, and I, I want to talk to you just a little bit about that difference before we close today, because I think it's so prevalent in our society. You see it everywhere. Once you see somebody who's got an investor mentality, and you, you absolutely see someone who has a consumer mentality. And it's one or two mentalities. Like, I'll go to kids' sports, and I'll see parents who absolutely are consumers. They see their children as a way to serve their needs. Like they're yelling out there and they're vicariously living through their child as they play sports. And you just realize, like, there's a consumer mentality. Why is my kid always crying? What's wrong with my reputation? Like, it's, it's all about them. And then you see other parents who have an investor mentality and they go, I may not fully get something out of this relationship the way that I want on this side of eternity, but I am investing because I realize children are not to be kept, but to be stewarded and to be sent. And there's an investment that's going to be made that I may never know the full degree of what that investment looks like because I've released that child to make a difference in their world. A very different mentality. It's, it's in the church. Right? There are people who walk through our doors on a Sunday, and I get it, I get the game, it's okay, but they've got a bit of a consumer mentality. It's sort of like, well, what's in it for me at this church? What can I get out of it? Is there something good for my kids? Is there something good for my teenagers? Something good for me on a Sunday? Do I like the music? Are the lights too bright? Are the lights too dim? Like We, we, we do this. We, we approach everything, either through the lens of a consumer, or there are other people who come to church, and they go, how do I make this place better for somebody else? How do I clean up? when nobody else is cleaning up? And how do I set out the coffee when no one else is going to set out the coffee? Even if I don't drink coffee, one of the fun facts that I love about our church is that almost everybody on our hospitality team does not drink coffee, and yet they make the coffee on Sunday. There is nothing that says, I am an investor more than saying, I hate coffee, but I'm going to make it for everybody else. There is an investor or a consumer mentality in all of us. And, and most of us are not just pure consumers or investors. There are spaces we walk into where we have an investor mentality and spaces we walk into where we have a consumer mentality. But what would your life look like if you began to approach it through the lens of an investor? I'll tell you this. I'll tell you, consumers are people who only care about themselves and their generation. These are people who are filled up by themselves and with themselves. And that's all that matters to them. Multi-generational thinking is not about what we get out of it, but it's about thinking about the next generation. This Greek proverb still runs true. It says, a society grows great when old men plant trees in shade they know they'll never sit in. And this is the mentality that moves you from consumer to investor. It makes me think of uh, Cuthbert Collinwood, who was the second in command of the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. And he's captaining the HMS Victory. Uh, they said it took 3,000 oak trees to build his ship. And so as he was stood there, what was probably most famous about him is as he was stood there at any presentation or just walking around, he always walked around with, with acorns in his pocket. And they said you could often find him just looking for a little plot of, uh, of land that he could dig and put an acorn in to, to develop something that he knew he would never get the benefit from. 
Great men and women exist when they have an investor mentality that says, I may not get anything out of this, but I am investing for future generations. Many of you have done that with your time in our church by investing with our students and our children and, and throughout the course of the years. Many of you have done that financially with this church. Many of you have done that just in your prayers for this church. We, we do this in a number of ways where we invest our lives for things that we may or may not get to see, but it's okay because we're not coming in with one mentality, but with another. Good spiritual investors are ones who take risks and make wise investments. Spiritual investors are people who realize that you're going to have to take a risk. You took a risk by coming here today. The minute you walked out of your house and got in your car, you took a risk and you came here today. But the scriptures teach us over and over through the parabolic teaching of Jesus that that's what he's called you to do. You can go to Matthew 13 and we see the seed being spread all over the ground. And Jesus says, this is what you do with your life. You sow into the lives of others. And sometimes it lands on the, on the, uh, the path and it doesn't grow. And sometimes it lands in the, the rocks. Other times it lands in the thorns. It's going to land in all types of soil. But you be faithful to invest into the lives of others. Then he told a story called the parable of the talents, where he said one guy got five, one got three, one got one. The guy who had five invested, the guy who had three invested, the guy who had one got scared and buried it in his backyard. And he said the wicked and lazy servant was the one with the one who did nothing with it. He didn't take a risk to invest. Then he said, there's another parable. He said, I want you to go to the highways and the byways and invite people to a party. The first people are going to be people who tell you, I'm too busy. I got other things going on. So then go past them and keep taking risks with people, even when they reject you, and invite them to the party. See, investors realize not all of their investments are going to work out. Some of them are going to fail. That shouldn't stop you from making investments. Don't let it stop you. Just every one of us, if we do this thing right, are going to have people that we invest into that turn their back on us at some point. They're going to look at us and go, you're terrible. You ruined my life. You did this. You did that. that that's, that's not unlike what Jesus dealt with. In John chapter 6, verse 66, it's the one that you can remember, 666. John 666, we have all these disciples turning their backs on Jesus because he says to them, like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they go, oh man, that sounds crazy. And they leave. And he looks at his disciples and he says, are you 12 going to leave as well? And they go, where else would we go? And they continue following after him. Like for every one of us who makes an investment in the lives of others, we need to remember Jesus had a Judas, Paul had a Demas, people who turned their back and walked away for the world. It's going to happen. But what investors understand is that there is a reward. There is a reward on the other side. And we may not see the fullness of that reward on this side. Good investors will never see the full reward on this side, but they will see the reward on the other side. Romans 2, 6 and 7 promises us this. It says, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence, not by ease, but by persistence in doing good, see glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Like, there is something on the other side we may not fully realize. And here is your challenge for this morning. Friends, some people will spend their life. Some will save their life or attempt to. Some will waste their life. But you have been called to invest your life. I don't care if it's early retirement and you can spend every waking moment on a beach somewhere. Don't be a consumer. Be an investor. It doesn't matter if you're still in your job or you're still doing this or still, seasons are going to come and go, but you were called to be an investor and the legacy of your life as a disciple maker is that you might point people to Jesus in doing so. And I don't care if you say I'm way behind the eight ball, like what have I done with the first 60 years of my life? I'm in my forties, my sixties, my eighties, I'm a hundred. It's not too late. It's not too late.
If you feel like you've wasted it all, like there's nothing good and you should just give up, how dare you? You've been given breath in your lungs. You've been given two feet to get you here to church or at least to turn on your computer screen at home. If you're sitting at home in bed sick, we're glad you're here. You can invest through technology. You can do it. We all can do something. We can all do something. It's not the end of your story. All I'm asking you to do is find a person, make an investment, lead them to Jesus, change a life. That's it. That's it. Just make the investment that you wish somebody would have made for you. Do it for somebody else. Don't let them stumble and figure it out. This is what it means to live a life of legacy. And this is what it means to respond to the call that God has given to you. To whom much is given, much is required. You've been given much. I haven't been given much. Yes, you have. You've been given much. Use what you've got. You may say, I feel like I'm a one talent person, Jake. Then multiply that one talent. I feel like I'm a five talent. Yeah, I know. I've been blessed. I got a lot. Then, then to whom much is given, much is required. Go make an investment in something that matters. Don't spend your life. Don't be a consumer that wastes its life. Don't try and save it up. For what? What are you hoarding? Go invest your life into the lives of others and allow this multi-generational God who defines himself this way to lead and guide you into this truth. Let's take a moment to pray together. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a God who cares about every generation, not just the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, but caring for each and every one of us. Thank you from the very beginning of time until now, you've held us in your hands. We know you've called us. We know you've equipped us. We know, God, we know we're passing something down. And so help us to share hope and to share life, to lead people close to your heart. God, help us. Help us to recognize and to live as though every decision is discipleship. God, as we seek to live as investors, would you lead us and guide us into places and spaces we should go? We thank you. We're committed to you. And we're committed to making this one life count. We trust you with it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All over this place where you stand, we're going to enter into a time of response and worship. And as we do this, your response may look individualized this morning. And I would encourage you, if, if you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit to respond in a specific way, we have these areas up here to my left and right, areas of prayer and response. I would encourage you to go. Find, find some time in the next song to make your way to these areas. There's gonna be individuals there ready and willing to pray with you, join their faith with yours. Maybe you wanna use this time as an opportunity to take communion by yourself, reflect with the Lord, write a prayer, pray with someone, whatever it may look like. I encourage you to do that. But in the room corporately, we're gonna to respond to this really challenging but so potently truthful word that every decision is discipleship and as we are taking that challenge upon us I, I want to sing the truth of this song Christ be magnified but not just be magnified be magnified in me that as the Lord leads us to the individuals that we are to leave a lasting legacy on and in, in walking in discipleship that before anyone ever ever sees us, that they see the Jesus inside of us. And so we'll just use these next few moments as a, a prayer really to the Lord that as we take on this challenge, God, that you would be magnified in us in every decision that we make and every move that we walk into, God. Let our life radiate to the presence of Jesus, amen. Creation, sir.
suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. We're gathered together to be reminded that every decision is discipleship. And that can either make you afraid or it can get you real excited. And I hope that today gets you real excited to know that we get this one life to invest it into the lives of others. So let's go and do that this week. Amen, church? All right.
Well, listen, as you leave this morning, we have some fun uh, Super Bowl stuff. There's some flat Stanley Chiefs figures you can take your pictures with. There's some paper football competition going out there that you can play and have fun with. But I wanna remind you about two tables that I want you to stop by in the middle of all the Super Bowl fun. One is the Lent table where we have these Canyons devotionals. Make sure you grab yours today because the first one starts this coming Wednesday on Ash Wednesday. So make sure you grab that devotional to walk you through this Lenten season. And then for all the ladies in the room, listen, we brought the beads back and here's why. Last year, Super Bowl Sunday, we're like, let's do a flash sale for Kindred's Conference. And we gave you beads with these little tickets. And then two weeks ago for AFC Championship, we're like, you know what? It worked on Super Bowl. They won. Let's bring it back for the AFC Championship. We'll do a flash sale for Kindred's. And so we gave you out your little beaded necklaces to wear to the game. And guess what? They won. So I had no choice, women. I had no choice but to bring back the necklaces today. I'm just saying, every time we've given out, they've won. But here's what I want you to do. Maybe you got one two weeks ago. Today, I want you to grab one for a friend. As Pastor Jake mentioned that story from scripture where you're to go to the highways and byways and invite people into the table and some will have excuses and say, I'm too busy and I, I have other obligations, but we have the opportunity to be a bringer, to make the difference in someone's life. Let's start today by making an investment into the life of one of our friends. All of you are gonna go into a Super Bowl party, grab a necklace, invite a woman to come with you. This flash sale, use the code CHIEFS. It will give you the group rate for conference, which is the cheapest rate of $60. I'm telling you, get your friends in this room and they will have a profound encounter with God and not be the same. So I wanna encourage you to stop by the booth and grab your necklaces today. Church, we love you. It's been a great day, hasn't it? It's gonna be an awesome afternoon. We will see you this Wednesday for Ash Wednesday services or Ash Wednesday prayer. Go now and be the church. Go in peace.